All right, and welcome to Journey with the Jays. It's me, Jake, along with my co-host, John, JB, and Spencer. We are here to talk all things sports, and considering we are in the midst of the NFL season, we're going to throw it right to Spencer to start us off. I know we got a lot of talk about this week, so Spencer, what do we got going on in the NFL? Thank you very much, Jake, for that awesome intro. Uh, I want to talk about that Arizona Cardinals-Buffalo Bills game from Sunday. Final score was Cardinals 32, Bills 30, but the way it ended, this was the most exciting finish to a football game we've had in recent memory. Josh Allen throws a touchdown pass to Stefan Diggs with 34 seconds left to take the lead for the Bills. With almost no time remaining, Kyler Murray gets the ball back, and he has a Hail Mary play to DeAndre Hopkins, who comes down with the football with three defenders draped all around him to win the game as time expires. Just an unbelievable finish. And, and even with the spread, Jake, Cardinals were, were a two-point favorite, and they need it with the extra point. They didn't, they didn't even take the point, so they didn't, even, they didn't even cover the spread. But just an unbelievable football game. Jake, what was going through your mind when, when Hopkins came down with that football? I mean, my first thought was, oh, my God. Like, did that really just happen? He didn't moss one guy. He didn't moss two guys. He mossed three guys. I have I, one of the best catches I've ever seen in my life. That was unbelievable. And I have to give a lot of credit to both Kyler Murray and DeAndre Hopkins. First of all, Murray getting around in the pocket, making that play even possible. He deserves a lot of credit for that. And, you know, I know he gets kind of overshadowed every now and again. You know, there's a lot of other bigger names at, at times that overshadow him, like Patrick Mahomes and Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers. They've been a little bit bigger this season because, you know, they've been especially – exceptional as as per usual for these guys but he's been you know because of the younger guys the newer guys been a little bit looked past at times he deserves a lot of credit that was an awesome play i mean that was he deserves a ton of credit because that was a really smart play on his play and then just deandre hopkins being deandre hopkins that was that was sick and then you know for our sunday show that you know our listeners on here that don't know we have a sunday show that we go over our picks of the week we talk about just nfl stuff um, so, you know, I had picked the Cardinals to cover a two point spread. I'm like, Oh my God, they scored a touchdown. They're up by two. So all they need to do is kick this extra point and I'm good. And they cover, right? No, they decide to just, no, they're not going to do that. Nope. They just want to keep the ball away. I was like, cool. Thanks for that. I was like, really appreciate that one. So it ends up going to a push. So if any betters are listening, if you were you know betting on the bills, I'm really sorry for you. Cause that has got to hurt. Cause that was, I mean, in a million years, I didn't see that coming. If you were betting on the Cardinals, at least you get your money back on the push. I mean, you know, at least you don't lose money, but that still sucks because they should have covered had that happened. But, you know, point is, that was just unbelievable. And it's got to be one of the best catches we've probably seen in the past at least decade, you know, if not longer. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty, pretty sick. You know, the you got to love Kyler Murray, what he does to that offense and having the receivers they have with Kirk Hopkins that they brought him in, they're going to be some team to, to face in a couple of years or they're just getting their feet wet. Now imagine a year or two play it together, how good they're going to be. And I mean, they're tied for the lead of the division now. So give them a year or two. They're going to, they're going to be able to control that division when Seattle's falling down and the Rams are on the way out and San Francisco can't, you know, stay healthy. It's going to be the, the Cardinals division, John. What do you think? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really happy for the Cardinals. I, I think they have a lot of things to clean up. Uh, they got away with one, obviously, against the Bills. Um, but they they have a chance to go out and prove it Thursday night um, against the Seahawks. In, they already beat the Seahawks once in Arizona. They go to Seattle. Seattle's not playing well. If they can beat them, then I take them serious. If they lose, it's it's not knocking them, but. This is a game they really got to show us what they're made of because they won on a miracle. It's, you know, call it what it is. Buffalo should have won that game. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy Arizona won. But uh, let's let's see if Arizona can go out and prove it and beat Seattle in Seattle. Then then I'll take them a little more serious. Their defense hasn't been great. Running game, not great. Kyler Murray has to make home run plays, and it's not necessarily the – you know, five yard, seven yard plays, it's home run or bust for that team. So let's see them prove it and be a little more consistent. 
I will say that the biggest loser in that Hail Mary play to DeAndre Hopkins, it has to be the Houston Texans and Bill O'Brien. I mean, they chose to trade him away for old man David Johnson. And I don't know if you guys have been paying attention this year, but David Johnson has not been on the field that much for the Houston Texans. And the Is Houston Texans okay? do not have a first-round pick. We own their first-round pick, so I just, I just had to throw that out there since we're talking Houston Texans. Yeah, I mean, that's got to hurt because, look, has David Johnson been good? Yeah, he's been all right when he plays. But now he's got a concussion, and he was out. And the truth is, he's not a game changer like DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins proved it this week. Plays like that, you're not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, David Johnson's that talent. No, David Johnson's probably a top half running back, just, you know, top half of the league, just because running backs run really thin. It's it's hard to get a, a legitimately talented running back these days. You know, you, you see that a lot, especially if you play fantasy football, you kind of realize that quickly. There's not that many star running backs. So if you want to call him a star running back, you can do that, I guess, because – he does have, you know, the namesake maybe kind of gives him that pedigree. He's not he's not the talent of a star running back all the time, but maybe the name alone. Again, he's an okay running back. DeAndre Hopkins is easily, not even a question, top five receiver. And you, you traded him for basically pennies on the dollar, and he just showed you why You know, everybody should be saying, what was that? What basically say, everybody remembers how bad that trade was, proving why it was such a bad trade. Because he's 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 a baller. He's unbelievable. He's amazing. How much, how, how much longer you want to talk about a bad trade? I mean, it was like one of the worst trades in history. <laughs> you know, it, I, I don't get it. It was horrible. It was a waste. And you know who I feel bad for in the, the most out of this? Deshaun Watson. You know, that, that yeah. guy needs to to do something to to prove himself because he's stuck in a bad situation at this point. I don't feel bad for him. He's the one that re-signed this year. He didn't have to. He could have been a free agent soon, and he re-signed. Look at I don't Dak. feel bad for him. Nah, look at Dak. You take the money. You can't You can't blame him for that. Football, he he would have got baseball. the money. He would have got the money from New England in a year or two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> New England gotta, would have been all over that. Got to take the money when you can in football. You can't, you can't leave it on the table. Look at Dak. Dak's unsure now what's going to happen to him. At least the show knows he's getting paid. Can't That's play, nice, play. but he'll never Next get a ring. Never he'll never get he'll a never ring in, in Houston. John, you brought it up. Uh, the Thursday night matchup tonight for those listening. Six and three Arizona Cardinals on the road against the six and three Seattle Seahawks. Forget spreads. Even though the Seahawks are a three-point favorite in this game, JB, who do you like to win and why? It's going to be a close game. Seattle in prime time is always a three-point game, so I don't expect anything different. Seattle's at home. I like Seattle. I think that they're going to win a very close game. It's going to be fun to watch, um, but you know, I don't, I don't think Arizona is going to come out and win this game after you know the hail mary last week. Uh, it's going to be a tough game for them to bounce back and play again. And the Rams are coming off a loss. I'm not the Rams. Seattle coming off a loss to the Rams. I think they're going to come out hungry and want to you know get stay on top of the division. I'm I'm gonna disagree with you, JB. My big my big concern is this: that Seattle defense is essentially hot garbage. That is, is is walking and plays on a football field at this point. They're they're horrible. It's one of the worst we've ever seen. And I'm not gonna sit here and say that Kyler Murray is uh, you know better than Russell Wilson because I don't I don't really feel that. I think I think they're both really good in this season. You could make the argument that they're both. At a similar level right now, they're obviously both in the MVP conversation at the moment, and I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but you know, Russell Wilson is still the better quarterback, if you ask me. Um, but the problem is, Kyle Murray, even though his defense is not amazing, at least he has a defense. He has a defense that you could call a defense. I barely call that Seattle defense a defense anymore. I just have to because that's the position that they're you know considered at this point. But it's terrible. It's terrible. And when it comes down to a shootout, do I trust Russell Wilson more if I was just going quarterback against quarterback? Yes. But when I look at the game itself, you know, who they're playing against, I like Kyler Murray against that defense a lot better. I just don't – I cannot – I have lost all faith, not that I've ever had much, in that Seattle defense. They're losing – you know, they're not looking what they – you know, they, they, they were at the beginning of the season. They're kind of in a little bit of a free fall right now. And I said just because they've lost – multiple games in a row now that they haven't looked as good. And I love Kyler Murray and what he's doing. 
And I think he's getting hot. And obviously you're seeing what him and DeAndre Hopkins can do when they get some time to really get to work together. I mean, they were great in the beginning of the season, but they, they feel you know unstoppable right now. And so, you know, if that Seattle defense was better, I'd give it to Seattle. I'd say they have the edge because they do have the better quarterback, and I feel like they have a better offense. But when you're talking about, you know, defense versus defense, I don't trust that Seattle defense at all. I do think it's going to be close. I agree with that. But I just – I don't have the faith that I would like to have in the Seattle team because of the defense. The offense can do all they want, but if they can't stop the Cardinals from scoring, it, it, it doesn't mean anything in the end. Yeah, this one's interesting for me. I have a lot of takeaways for this. Um, well, Chris Carson's questionable, but he has an excellent chance to play, according to the Seahawks. So he was limited. He was limited in practice. But they said, and and Carlos Hyde also they, was a full participant. But they said practice. he has an excellent chance to play as of Tuesday. So that, to me, that means he's going to play. And if he plays, that gives their defense a chance, since they haven't had a running game in the past couple games. Coincidentally, is when they lost. It gives them a chance to slow down the game, give the defense a chance to not be on the field so much. Um, that's a big thing. Also, another big thing was uh, DK Metcalf had frustrations with Russell Wilson, missed him on a wide-open touchdown um, against the Rams. You don't typically see receivers with showing frustration with Russell Wilson. Uh, so that was something to monitor. Um, because Seattle's had their issues in, in the past. There's been players in Seattle in the past that have had their issues with Russell Wilson. So that's something to monitor. Um, if Chris Carson plays and he's healthy, then I think Seattle ultimately wins because they finally have their run game back, and that can give their defense a little bit of a breather. And Russell Wilson doesn't have to do it all on his own, which that's what he's been doing he's in his losing streak. He's been trying to do everything himself. And he's been creating turnovers and things like that because he's trying to put it all on his back, which no player should ever do. But when, when he has a run game, he won't feel as much pressure. Yeah, but you're, you're talking about time of possession. If you look at Seattle's time of possession this year, it's not a horrible time of possession. They they're have, they have the ball almost 50% of the game. They're a few seconds short of uh, half the game. So they're keeping their defense off the field. To well, out. the last in their losing streak, they haven't had a run game because Chris Carson's been hurt, and yeah. coincidentally, that's when they've been losing. So when they get Carson back, who's the heart and soul of that offense, um, people don't really realize that, but he really does make that offense go. As we've seen, Seattle hasn't looked the same. The Buffalo and the Rams took advantage of them. They have a run game; it changes that whole offense. Well, it's easy to scheme against a team that can only do one thing. You know, exactly. It doesn't take much to be an NFL uh, defensive coordinator when you know they're going to have to throw passes. You know, so that, that'll change the game a little bit. I don't think it's the time of possession, though. I think it's more of the scheme. You, you're able to keep Kyler Murray off the field a little more, um, which, which as we've said before, guys like Murray and Mahomes, if you can keep them off the field, kind of messes with their head a little bit because they have to sit and think more. Seattle. So that's just me. Seattle in their last three, uh, five games is – is two and five, two and three, not a great record. The Cardinals are coming into this game having won four of the last five. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is the Spider Man meme, right? When Spider Man's pointing at the other Spider Man, these two teams are very similar. They're explosive offensive teams. The Cardinals are coming in this game averaging 29.6 points per game, Seattle 32.2 points per game. They're allowing 23 points per game for the Cardinals and Seattle's allowing close to 30 points per game, which is just Jake, you mentioned how atrocious their defense is. That's embarrassing, but these two teams, they, they, they have a very similar style to them. And when two teams are similar more times than not, I'm going to take the team with more experience. I'm going to take Russell Wilson. I'm going to take the Seahawks. They, you know, that defense has to go against Wilson every week in practice. I think in regards to the other 31 teams in the league, Seattle's defense would would have a great feel of, of just how Kyler Murray can tear them up and how they can kind of just limit him and slow him down and, and maybe have a QB spy of some sorts. But they, they know the type of quarterback and player that Kyler Murray is. They saw him once earlier in the year. Obviously, that was an overtime win for the Cardinals. Jeff Cadillac, our gambling guy on the Sunday show, he says it's very hard for a team to sweep a team in the same division. I think that Seattle evens out this series, and I think they win. I'll say this. It will be close no matter what. 
But again, just my only thing, I just kind of checked on that because I was curious. And this kind of goes to back to what I was saying about you know, the defensive struggles that I'm worried about. Arizona's defense, surprisingly, according to Pro Football Reference, they're actually ranked eighth in, in the league, which is better than I anticipated. But they, again, it just goes to prove it's a solid defense. And then all the way near the bottom of the list, they're not the worst defense in the league, but they are pretty bad. And depending on obviously what stat you're looking at, they might be last. But overall defense, Seattle's 27. So that's that's just my big concern is when you when, you know when you're talking about defenses, which is my you know my real worry. I, I don't I, I don't trust I don't trust that C defense enough to shut down you know to shut down Kyler Murray. And I'm not saying that Arizona's going to shut down Russell Wilson because they're not. But if it's, if you know you have to trust one of those two defenses, we all can agree we're trusting Arizona before we trust Seattle every single time. And that's my that's my one concern. I don't know that they can shut them down. I just think the discrepancy might be might be smaller than you're you're, you're saying. But um, I, I want to get into this MVP conversation because we have two MVPs playing in the game tonight, MVP candidates playing in the game tonight, and Kyler Murray and Russell Wilson. You got guys like Rodgers, Mahomes having great years. I'll throw Roethlisberger and Dalvin Cook, give them some consideration. Uh, John, let's start with you. Through 10 weeks of the season, who is your NFL MVP? Um, that's hard. There's a lot of uh, a lot of different guys that you really could go with. Um, I think Patrick Mahomes has to lead it. Um, I know he's thrown about, I think it's 25 touchdowns and one interception. Um, I know the stats are a little misleading because there's, I, I read the other day that there's been about eight plays that should have been a turnover by him that was dropped by the defense uh, or maybe a fumble that wasn't picked up by the defense. Um, but overall, Mahomes is just, I mean, I know he's kind of, they're kind of coasting, but Mahomes has to be the MVP right now uh russell wilson's fallen off and as we've seen before russell wilson's played like this and then we get to the middle of the season and he has this um this roadblock for a couple games or he kind of falls off and then uh, he never gets back into the mvp conversation so has to be mahomes uh there's really not a lot of uh, people out there that you can he can that compete with him right now um you don't have lamar jackson they're not really doing anything steelers you're not going to get one because and there's so many different guys, and it's not really a stati statistical type of team. It's more of a team effort as opposed to just one guy. Uh, so there's really not a lot of guys out there that you could match up Patrick Mahomes with. Russell Wilson's fallen off, so Kyler Murray maybe. But, you know, I, I still think it's Mahomes when they're arguably the best team in the league. John, you're wrong. I'm sorry. But, look, Patrick Mahomes has played great, and he's kind of going to become – what the MLB has in Mike Trout. He's going to be the easy answer almost every year where you can just say, oh, yeah, it's got to be him. But you're not but going to who's, who's going to compete with him? I'm going to tell you right now, Russell Wilson. And it's – I don't think I, – I, I get what you were saying he's falling off, but he's really not. In the past four games, Seattle has won just one game. Cardinals, 49ers, Bills, Rams. In those four games, first game against Cardinals, Russell Wilson's throws for 388 yards, three touchdowns, three interceptions. Three interceptions was bad, okay? But then you go to the next week. They win against the 49ers. Russell Wilson has another nice game. Russell Wilson goes for 261, four touchdowns. Nice game, right? Then against the Bills, in a game he loses 44 to 34. And I don't put the blame on him for this because he goes for 390, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Solid those, Bills defense. Those were garbage stats. Let's just it say doesn't that. Matter. Was terrible that game. You can't just go by – like. You watch that game. I'm, he turned that ball over and lost points. that match. Are you seriously going to blame Russell Wilson for giving up 44? He dropped 34. But he, but he also – his turnovers really cost them that game. He had a lot of turnovers that turnovers. really – He had two. That killed their two. drives. He had two turnovers. That's fine. But, again, it's not his fault his defense led up 44. Even if he's responsible for two turnovers that lead to two touchdowns, that's 14 points. Guess what? You take those 14 points away, it's 34-30. So guess what? It's not all him because they still score 30 points that wouldn't be on his on his shoulders. And then the only bad game in the stretch he's had, which is not even terrible, is against the Rams. He goes 248. He doesn't throw any touchdowns. He throws two interceptions. But still, he he's over four times against Buffalo. He lost two fumbles and, and I'm talking about interceptions. Picks. I'm talking about yeah, just but I'm just right saying there. turnovers. Yeah, that's fine. But more importantly, let's talk about his individual stats that don't affect anybody but him. Yardage, he lands second, only behind Josh Allen. 
completion percentage. He lands himself still in the uh, in, in the, in the top ten at number or top five, excuse me, at number four. Only Ryan Fitzpatrick, who hasn't played in a while, Teddy Bridgewater, who is not going to be in any consideration, and Drew Brees, who is always you know consistently extremely accurate, is above him. Okay, talk about touchdowns. Russell Wilson's number one leads the league with twenty eight. So you know, and then the list goes on and on. I I can keep going and throw more stats. Touchdown percentage, he he's, he leads the league again, and and I can give you more and more stats, but I don't want to sit here and just throw stats. The point is, yeah, his team hasn't been winning, but he has got some sick numbers, and he's been you know, for for lack of a better way to describe it, he's been cooking, and even when he's been on a a bad stretch, he still looks great, and that's my thing. I get Patrick Mahomes, but those numbers are skewed, like you said. And again, he's going to be the, always the easy pick, kind of like the Mike Trout of baseball. You know, uh, you know where where Mike Trout's always the easy choice, but you got to pick. You can't always pick that guy. Russell Wilson, in this case, I think has finally earned the respect to get an MVP. But that's just my thoughts. JB, who is your MVP? Got to be Dalvin Cook. Russell Wilson's a good choice, and he deserves a vote. But Dalvin Cook, guys, averaging five point four yards per carry. 954 yards already, missed a week of the season, so he's only played eight games, almost has 1,000 yards, 12 touchdowns already. He's got what? He's only got two fumbles. The guy's doing everything. You know, he, he has a legitimate shot to get to 2,000 yards. He's had three games over 150 yards. You know, he's the lifeline of their offense. Can't go wrong with Dalvin Cook. Now, it's usually a quarterback um, award, but this year I think you got to look elsewhere. I don't. I mean, the only guy that's close to him as far as rushing, you know, Derrick Henry, but Derrick Henry's run the ball 27 more times. 5.4 yards a carry. That's a lot of yards a carry. You rush twice, it's a first down. Who's competing with that? The only thing I'll say to that, and, and I love your pick, is the only way Adrian Peterson got his MVP was when he just about broke the rushing record in a season. He was like a couple yards shy of the rushing record. That's what it took to get him the MVP. That's how much running backs need to do to get the MVP. I don't agree with it. I think that running backs and other players should be, you know, given more opportunities at the MVP than just a quarterback. But it took Adrian Peterson basically breaking the rushing record. He was like a couple yards shy. And that's when he got MVP. So that's how running backs are treated for these awards. Well, you have to look at it this way, though. He plays for Minnesota. Kirk Cousins is the quarterback. So oh, it's I like agree. With without that. a quarterback. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So basically, the best offensive player would be between him or Thielen, and Thielen doesn't get enough touches to be in the MVP race. So I completely reason. agree with you. Yeah. 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 I, I I agree with what you said. I love him. And honestly, I was gonna. It's funny you say that. My non-quarterback. MVP, there's no doubt Dalvin Cook. It's not even close. Problem is, like you said, it's just a quarterback-driven, uh, you know, award, yeah. and, and 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 that's the problem. No matter how great Dalvin Cook will be, he's always going to compare to the quarterback, and that's the big problem. I agree. If I had to pick, you know, a non-quarterback, which obviously I could have, but the problem is, like I said, driven by quarterbacks, and even I admit it, I ran right to a quarterback, and and so did John. I and mean, that's not a fault to any of us. It's just the way – it's the nature of the award the way it's been. Offensive player of the year, though, I think should go to Dalvin Cook at that point. That is my, my, my honest thoughts because he may not win the MVP, but if you want to talk about the most valuable offensive player at the very least, I do agree with that. I like that because that's not always a quarterback-driven uh, you know, uh, award. That does have a little more variance. So he, I believe he will get some consideration at the very least, but I, I like the pick. I think, it's, I think it's great. It's just you know like the problems we pointed out quarterback driven sadly i i want to point something out russell wilson has more picks than daniel jones just want to let yeah, you know that we'll, more picks we'll, than we'll, daniel we'll, jones. well that's definitely going to daniel jones he's, <laughs> he's he's turnover machine and we all know that he's third in the league in interceptions russell wilson john i'd appreciate it if you didn't give away my mvp choice daniel jones <laughs> um no, if, if I had to pick somebody right now, I mean, if I'm if I'm gambling on this, I'm taking Aaron Rodgers. I mean, uh, is it 26 touchdowns to three interceptions? He's second in the league in yards. Uh, the Packers are one of the best teams in football, and it's almost under the radar every single week. They have not had Aaron Jones for the majority of the year. He's been banged up here and there, although he has been great when he plays. Uh, but Rodgers has has totally resurrected that 
MVP, Aaron Rodgers form that, that we're so used to. He's my safe pick. My wild card pick, if you want to be a crazy man, Josh Allen has picked up his play in recent weeks. And if the Bills are able to win that division for the first time in a long time, John, I understand you're, you're a Tua guy, but hear me out. <laughs> Allen is, has been tremendous. So Allen's numbers, Allen's thrown for 21 touchdowns, seven interceptions. He's up there in yards, but Allen's got those five rushing touchdowns. Now, I'm not sure there's a world in which, in which you give it to Josh Allen over Kyler Murray. I, I guess that's tough because Murray does the same thing. And yeah, I think Murray has like 10 rushing touchdowns, yeah. Right. I think Murray's a better player than Allen. But if Allen wins that that division, that AFC East, I mean, it's been a while since someone not named Tom Brady and the, and the Patriots have won that division. So I would definitely think he'll get some strong consideration. But my safe pick is Aaron Rodgers. A solid pick. I, I, I can't argue with it. Again, another great quarterback that's been, you know, again, best way to describe it, he's been cooking. He's he, – He's pissed off Aaron Rodgers, and you don't want to mess with pissed off Aaron Rodgers. And he, he does not. What's that, JB? No, I don't think any of the picks are bad, or none of them are out there. I could see one of those yeah. five picks winning without without question, because everyone makes great points for their their particular person. Now, my question: Rookie of the Year. We saw two out of the three candidates uh, just before defense we or offense. Football. Offense. Uh, we, we saw Tua, we saw Herbert last week where the Dolphins, you know, came out and won. And I'm sure, John, you were very happy. What you, what you think of uh, their performances? Um, if you're asking me specifically, uh, Tua played exactly how the Dolphins are uh, putting him out there uh, to manage the game, but also make timely, accurate throws whenever he's asked to throw the ball, um, not turn the ball over. He's smart about his decision making. He's, he's playing that at about as high of a level as you can when it comes to being the game manager, because that's what they're asking them to do. And when you're a quarterback or whatever position you do, uh, whatever they ask you, you do your job. So he's doing it, you know, the right way. Uh, Herbert, I think he got exposed a little bit by Miami's defense. Uh, part of that's Miami's defense. Part of that, I think um, he pads his stats from time to time. But if you're asking me uh, offensive rookie of the year, I would have to go uh, Justin Jefferson. I mean, Justin Jefferson's been fantastic. He's not going to get it because he's not a quarterback. It's going to go to Herbert or Burrow. Um, but Justin Jefferson's been fantastic. Him, T. Higgins, Brandon Ayuk, all are their grades are off the charts when it comes to pro football focus. Um, their grades are just fantastic. I believe T. Higgins actually has the best grade out of the three, and then it's uh, Jefferson, then Ayuk. But uh, I think Jefferson should get Offensive Rookie of the Year, but it's going to go to a quarterback like Herbert yeah. or Burrow. You don't think Tua has enough time to sway yeah. the vote? He's not. He's not putting up stats. Um, they're winning. Don't get me wrong, but he hasn't played the entire year. He's he's going to play half a year. You're not going to get it unless you're throwing like 400 yards and a couple touchdowns a game. Um, he, he's not going to get it. Not even close yeah. to that conversation. And he shouldn't be. You know, he's just managing the game. I I agree with all that. Look, he's played well and they've won a lot, but I think a lot of that falls on the defense and. It's just he's not gonna have enough time, but yeah, I like the, the Justin Jefferson pick. I do like that, but the problem is, like you said, another quarterback driven position usually, uh, you know, unless he's like off the charts, unless you know, you're like a Randy Moss, which he's not. I hate to say, but he's you know, he's not that great. He's good, but he's not that great. I'd probably go to Justin Herbert, honestly. And I know earlier we talked about, you know, like earlier, uh, you know, in previous shows we talked about Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert. And my vote is still with, with with Herbert right now. He's got more touchdowns. He's only got one more interception. He's got a better QBR, and he's only about a hundred yards shorter, um, you know, than, than what Burrow's done in, in a few less games. Herbert's been a pretty solid quarter, rookie quarterback, and I, I, he deserves a lot of credit. But I do like the Justin Jefferson pick if it could go to anybody. Which I mean, yes, it can. But you know exactly what I mean by that being that it's not going to a non-quarterback, almost guaranteed. I'll tell you guys this, no rookie quarterback has wowed me. Burrow, Herbert, they've kind of regressed these last few weeks. John, I think two is too green. I don't think he's going to see the field enough to win this award. I'm going to go with with, with two, one of two guys that I think have had fantastic rookie campaigns. One is Chase Claypool, the receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He has been phenomenal. He's been Roethlisberger's number one guy. He's overtaken uh, Juju Smith-Schuster as, as that team's go-to guy, along with Deontay Johnson, who's been great as well. Um, but he is a huge reason for Pittsburgh's success. The other guy I want to go with is, is one, of the, one of the players on, on one of the worst teams in football, and that's James Robinson. 
the running back for the Jaguars. He's been a top five running back this year. Consistently, he's, he's, he's been in almost every game. He's seen the field. He is the only source of offense for that team. And, and each week he, he comes, he runs hard, he, he does his work. He, right, he's having a better season than Clyde, Clyde Edwards Hilaire. He's been asked to do a little bit more. Um, you know, DeAndre Swift and J.K. Dobbins, they've been inconsistent. I like Swift's game a lot, but I think AP ate up a lot of his carries in the, in the beginning of the season. Um, I like Chase Claypool or James Robinson. Those are my two wild card rookie of the year picks. Good choices. I, 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 can't, I can't disagree. Yeah, Jake. No, as I was say, I, I like that James Robinson call. He's top five running back right now in terms of yardage. It's pretty yeah. good, and I, I, I do like that, considering especially the fact that he was undrafted. Somehow he fell beneath everybody, and he's I, – I, I, I didn't think about him, again, because, like I said, it's a quarterback-driven position, so you really gravitate, you know, gravitate towards them. But that's another good idea. I, I, I do like that pick. That's, uh, he's, been, he's been pretty special, I have to admit, and – for a bad team, it's it's been nice for them, I'm sure. Also, forget the quarterbacks for a change. Enough with them. They win enough awards. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> yes. Uh, does anybody have a defensive rookie of the year? Because I have one that I'm just ecstatic about, and I think this guy's going to be a star for a long, long time. Carolina Panthers, Jeremy Chen. Absolutely love this guy. He does everything for that defense. Number 21. He plays linebacker. He plays safety. Dude does everything. This guy is. I I, I don't want to go in too long because I know you know defense isn't the sexy thing to talk about. But watch that guy play. Watch one Panthers game. Watch number twenty one the entire game. You'll fall in love with his play. He's just he's going to be a star for a long, long time. He's fantastic. Like this guy, he just he does everything for the defense, and you love a player like that. So that that would be my guy. Yeah, I don't have right, them, but... three giant fans. You know, we love defense. <laughs> right, right now the front runner for uh, rookie of the year on the defensive side is Chase Young at uh, at plus two twenty, and then offensively mm-hmm. it is uh, pl- uh, Joe Burrow actually at plus two forty. Oh no, wait, I'm sorry. These were prior to week one. Forget I said that. Um, <laughs> all right, JB, we got a lot of basketball to talk about. Let's get into it. Wow. A lot of big news in the NBA. Where do we start? There's so much going on. Oh my gosh. Mean, I mean, this time of year, we're usually playing basketball. The NBA is usually in its first or second week. Um, you know, we're starting to talk about the games we got coming up on Christmas Day. Looking forward to it. But, you know, right now we're, we're pretty much it's like hot stove baseball going on right now. We're all filling our needs here. I think the biggest thing going on right now is the talks of James Harden turning down the extension in Houston and wanting to go to the Brooklyn Nets. Now, I'm going to go right to you, Spencer, because you do have the Nets podcast. Um, tell us what you've been hearing and what you think about the whole situation and what the Nets would have to give up to get them. Yeah, I appreciate that. Fireside Nets with Spen and Nick. You can check us out on, on Apple and Spotify. Um, so I'm heavy into Nets Twitter. I see basically everyone who covers the Nets, what they're saying. I, I communicate with them a lot. And the biggest thing as of late is Anthony Puccio, Pooch, who's, who's one of the biggest Nets reporters out there, He broke the story, I believe at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, that the Nets and Rockets are nearing an agreement to send James Harden to Brooklyn. Now, what everyone thinks this package is going to look like, the Nets are going to include Karis LeVert, Jared Allen, both young upcoming players, very, very good. All-star potential is there. Not sure yet, but it's there. A ton of draft picks, Torian Prince, Joe Harris's name has been floated out there. Spencer Dinwiddie is obviously... Uh, looking to move on to, to his next team as as he kind of sees his window with Brooklyn fading with with Kyrie and 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 Karras and Durant. So all those guys, but I, I think it's going to look something like Harden and one more guy, and the, the Nets are going to send over as I mentioned Jared Allen, Karras Levert, Torian Prince, and a bunch of draft picks. It's it's going to be a huge massive deal. Now since that uh, little bit of news came out earlier today, and it's Tuesday night, I, I have not heard anything since i don't know if anyone else has but this seems like it's inevitable because at the end of the day all reports say that james harden a wants out of houston and b he's willing to to go to two places philadelphia because of the daryl morey connection and brooklyn because of kevin durant because of mike d'antoni i mean take your pick there's there's a ton of reasons why he wants to come to brooklyn but that's what i'm hearing from from my net sources jake john are you guys hearing anything else 
Steve yeah. Nash used to Steve Nash is there in Brooklyn. Steve Nash was with Mike D'Antoni. It just it fits. Yeah, I, I saw a little bit of something on uh, on Bleach Report. You know, it's that, that's usually the other place I go for my news. I just I heard basically that uh, you know the, the Rockets are not going to part with James Harden for nothing. Obviously, that makes sense. And they say they say the same thing about Russell Westbrook, and they're looking for a massive massive deal, which we talked about. More importantly, they are considering starting the season with both of the stars on the team because they are still under contract at this point. Um, and, and so it's really just going to depend on can a team get a deal done. It's not really – I don't think it's a matter of if. It's just a matter of really when, I guess. Um, but it does seem like it's possible if the Nets don't get the deal done soon enough. Maybe they you know, they get them during the season. Who knows? Um, but obviously the Rockets, like we said, are looking for a lot, which they, it makes sense. And they are looking for a young star or, or a, a player, at least with, with potential to be a star. Um, obviously, again, makes sense. And and real quick, but, but before we move on to uh, to other moves in the NBA, for all the fans out there who are wondering what the dynamic will look like, how these three ball dominant players will mesh on the court, when you have the opportunity to get James Harden caliber talent, it doesn't matter what the fit is. You go out and you get him and you bring him into Brooklyn. John, I, I see you have a point, but Durant, Kyrie, James Harden, Good luck stopping that offense. Okay, what's your rebuttal for me? Yeah, uh, so Kyrie was unhappy because he wasn't the guy in Cleveland. They won a championship, and he still wasn't happy because LeBron James was the guy. Very different. Then Very he different. had. Then he yeah. went to. Then he went to the Celtics to be the guy, and it didn't work out. How's he going to handle being the third wheel? Because you know he's the third best player of James Harden's there. Kevin Durant and Very James different. Harden are better players. And, and Kyrie has an ego. How is he going to handle that? Because he couldn't handle it with the best player, arguably the best player in the world, LeBron James, after winning the championship. How is he going to handle this? How is he going to handle having to give up the ball to guys like James Harden and Kevin Durant? That's, that's well, hard because, remember, Miami had a lot of ego. Yeah, but well, you're talking about LeBron, who was like his father. Now, most people, when you're in your early 20s, you rebel against you know, the, the system. You may be, you know, doing everything great, but, you know, you don't want to be told what to do. You want to do your thing. LeBron's going to tell you what to do. You're going to do it and you're going to accept it because you want to win. That's that's his team. Now, you don't want to do that. That's what Kyrie went through and that's why he left. It's not that he couldn't handle it. He was a young kid at that time. And Kyrie's the same guy now as he was he's then. Oh, he oh John, John, I, I, I disagree one hundred percent. He's the same guy. He's always. Oh, let, let's guy. let's let's take a step back. First of all, there's a lot of things that the the national media, including people who don't play pay co close attention to Kyrie, don't see. For example, he's in the community today. He's giving out um, food and 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 money and items to people who need them. So there's a lot of things that people don't see about Kyrie. So I want to start there. Second off, he's he's home. He's from New Jersey. He's from the area. He's not playing in Cleveland. He's not playing in Boston. His family lives here. So I, I disagree with the notion that you think he's the same guy. I mean, he doesn't view Kevin Durant, as, as JB was saying, as a father figure. He views Kevin Durant as a contemporary. He but views he James gonna, Harden as a contemporary. Well, hold on. How's he going to feel play. being the third wheel? Here's one thing I want to about being a third wheel. Go ahead, Jake. He, he chose to be with Durant. You have to understand that. Him and Durant are friends and made a clear decision together, whether it's admitted in the media or not, they very clearly talked in the offseason and said, okay, let's go to Brooklyn together. This would be fun. And they said, sure, let's do it. So at the very least, you know for a fact he wants to be with KD. And then he's got the chance to partner up with Harden and obviously to bolster his, his chances at winning a championship. You know by now, if as you say, he's the same guy, he would have been very vocal in saying, I don't want to play with Harden. And he would have said something if he was the same guy as you say he is. He hasn't said a word. I haven't heard anything specifically and more importantly, anything negative yet saying, that, oh, I don't want this to happen. If I'm Kyrie, that's like that's basically just saying, here, have the championship. I mean, I know, I mean I'm not saying they're automatically guaranteed to win. That's going to be a really great team. I mean, you have three guys that are – you know, uh, you know, easily MVP candidates at the very least. I mean, that's sick. I mean, we thought the Golden State Warriors were a super team. Wait till we see. We, you know, if this happens, wait till we see this. This is going to be scary. And anyone that thinks they know anything about Kyrie, 
check out JJ Reddick's podcast from a couple of years ago. Where you actually, JJ has a great interviewing skill, especially when he has other players on that he has relationships with. They open up to him and you get to see the person they are. And I have a lot of respect for him. But if you listen to Kyrie's interview, I became a huge fan of him after that. You see a complete different side of him, you know. And as Spencer just pointed out, you know, he's matured, he's gotten better, he's at home. You know, Kyrie's going to bring a championship to my, to my city of Brooklyn. Forget about the Knicks and New York. You know, Brooklyn's going to win a championship it's with or without James Harden. It's such a disservice to say that about about uh, Golden State, Jake. Wow, that's such a disservice to them. They're a better team, even if the Brooklyn Nets get, even if the Brooklyn Nets oh. get James Harden. Golden State's better, and Golden State's going to Harden, get better. Durant and Kyrie. Not I, Golden State. I love Steph Curry. I love Clay Thompson. They're they're top notch guys. There is no way you're telling me that Harden and Kyrie are not better than Steph and Clay together. There's no way. I mean Durant is Durant. At, at this <laughs> at this point, guys, it's a wait and see game. When when the Warriors acquired Kevin Durant, I do remember that same you know there's one ball argument that mm-hmm. went around. How is Curry going to eat? How is Clay going to eat? How is Kevin Durant going to eat? They all managed to 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 eat that season and win two championships. So well, Clay well, Thompson. It, Clay Thompson and, and Steph Curry aren't guys that, that are ego driven either. They're not guys that have ever been that yeah, way. Yeah, but this was know? their team and, and KD was coming into their team. I, I'm John, I'm just talking from a basketball perspective. That, that's all I'm saying. A lot of people yeah. had the same argument then. It's the same argument now with the one ball, too many guys. Let's let's see how it works out. JB, mm-hmm. I know we got a ton of more uh, yeah. ton more NBA yeah. news on the docket. La- last word on that one. To get to where any of these guys are to be a superstar of the NBA, you have an ego. You could pretend you don't. You got an ego. You don't just get there when I have an ego. We have egos doing this. James Harden is That's not it. guaranteed to Done. go there. The, according to Tim McMahon of, the, of ESPN, uh, the general manager for the Rockets said, we're willing to make our players uncomfortble, the unhappy players uncomfortable, yeah. if sure, that's what it takes going into training camp. So it's not a guarantee. Just, it's it's that's all about drive up the price. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But now let's go over to CP3. Is he going to play for every team in the NBA? <laughs> Now he's now he's going to Phoenix. I mean, does no one like CP3? I heard he's really hard to get along with, and you know, but the guy's a really good player. He's older. He's a leader. Phoenix thinks that that's going to be the guy to get them into the playoffs. Finally, uh, they finished what eight zero in the bubble. They were exciting to watch. They were the way they were moving, but they went and got CP3, who has had trouble meshing with a bunch of teams. Was this a good move for them? What do you think, John? I think it was a fantastic move for them. Uh, they got a great young core. We were all talking um, in our shows back, you know, when the bubble was happening. We we talked, we raved about how the Suns are were really good. They went eight and zero. We were excited to see them the next season, whenever that would would have been. And um, and now they get CP three, a, a guy who has a lot of veteran leadership. Um, he can bring a lot to those young guys like Booker and, and folks like that. Um, and they already have a good core adding him. I mean, this is just a great move. It doesn't put them over the top, but it really sets them up, you know, going forward in a positive way. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. This is going to be so fun to watch. I mean, you're going to have Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton, and, and, and CP3 all together. That's going to be really fun to watch. I mean, look, CP3 is not going to go out there and, you know, drop 40 points every game. It's not going to happen. It's not the kind of year. He was never the guy to really do that in the first place, realistically. But especially not at this age. But man, can he pass the rock? That guy has got some of the most amazing, you know, ball moving skills we've probably seen in the past decade at least. He's he's really fantastic when he's on the you know when on the court and doing that. And that's gonna be really fun to watch, especially with these young guys. I'm really excited to see how he gets the ball, especially you know we talked about in the bubble. Devin Booker was you know he looked great. Imagine you know imagine that. But now with CP3, who's going to give him the ball, you know, and really make plays with him, it's going to be really fun to watch. And I, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's going to be a team that wins a championship yet. They don't have the the pieces at the moment, and they don't have the experience. But to make the playoffs, sure, could happen. I, I could see that absolutely. And who knows? Playoffs are crazy. Maybe they can make some noise. Maybe they don't win a championship, but maybe they make a little bit of noise when they, you know, if they make it. Yeah, I uh, I like the signing. I think that um, or I like the trade. I think it's uh, I think it's a good deal for Phoenix. They they haven't had a great 
point guard since Steve Nash. It's been a long time. Um, but if you look uh, in comparison to the other Western Conference teams, they're probably the five or six seed right now. Uh, they're not better than the Lakers. They're not better than the Clippers, the Nuggets, uh, the Jazz, and the Mavericks. They're probably in that tier. I mean, I, I throw out the Rockets because I think they're going to trade hard in. The Thunder obviously are out. So, yeah, I think Phoenix makes the playoffs, but I think they're probably a five or a six seed. Yeah, going on, going to the draft now. So the latest uh, mock NBA draft by ESPN, they got Anthony Edwards uh, going to Minnesota at one, Wiseman to Golden State at two, which is a great pick for them. They need a, a nice center. Um, Lamelo going to Charlotte at three, and the hometown Real 1100 Atlanta Hawks getting Oneka Ukongwa at a USC uh, forward center, which is an interesting pick if they don't trade down. Uh, you know, they don't need a center right now or a big, but for the future, that's not a bad move. What do you guys think of the draft coming up? Uh, by the time you listen to this, the draft will be over. But if you watch it now, you got it tomorrow. Jake? Yeah, I, I, honestly, my only thought, and, I, you know, look, I'm a Knicks fan, but this is the honest truth, the Knicks trade up. I think, honestly, if Atlanta is, you know, I, I, I know Atlanta is considered trading down. They can move up a few spots. It's not going to be a huge difference. Move up a few spots. You know, I mean, the Knicks got, got kind of screwed in the draft lottery. We all saw what happened. And obviously Golden State, that's that's going to hurt a lot of teams, uh, you know, because they're already a great team. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be what we expect. Hopefully, you know, we see some trades. I, I could see the Warriors maybe trying to trade that pick if they get the right offer. I wouldn't, it w- I wouldn't put it past them. I, you know, it's not like they're in desperate need of players. Obviously, they have Clay Thompson and Steph Curry, so – they're, 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 you know they're, they're going to be a, a team to compete with no matter what. But other than that, I, I don't see too much happening. I don't think it's going to be crazy. I think the one guy to watch out on the draft board is Mike Lenore, our boy, our, our, our friend of the show. Spencer, what do you think? Spencer, you're muted. I like I like that in Gonku kid. Six foot nine, big from USC, as 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 JB said. Averaged 16.2 points per game in his freshman year there. Uh, he, he's he's a strong player. He reminds me a little bit of, of like um, a stronger version of Sharif Abdul-Rahim, who had a lot of great years with the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, I, I think you got to start to surround Trey Young with some offensive weapons. That's what they lacked last year. Uh, Cam Reddish, uh, underwhelmed, in my opinion. You got a lot of guys on that team. DeAndre Bembry is not an offensive player. Uh, you need to add some scores to that lineup, and and I think that Ngaku can come in and, and really contribute right away. I really love how you pronounce those names. That is, you just, fantastic job. I couldn't have done that. That was just really well done. I just have to say that because I was super impressed. Wonderful. I, I'm excited to see what the Golden State Warriors do. I mean, that I think that is the biggest thing in this draft. Do they take somebody, like Jake said, do they trade uh, to get a player and let somebody move up into that spot? Uh, that's that's the biggest question mark to me. I haven't heard many rumblings lately about them trading away the pick, but that's that's the place that I'm uh, really looking at. Uh, so that's what I would keep my eye on. Well, I think that's yeah, it that's, pretty, that's pretty much it for the NBA, John. What's going on in baseball? I know you previewed something last week. We got a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, so we got into this little conversation about um, should Barry Bonds be a Hall of Famer? Uh, should Pete Rose be a Hall of Famer? Um, I think Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know, gambling's legal now. Pete Rose is the greatest hitter we've ever seen. Um, no doubt about that. They're not going to let him in. Honestly, they're probably not going to let him in until he dies, and that's a sad thing. They're going to wait until he dies, and then they're going to put him in the Hall of Fame. And that's going to be like a, uh, a backhanded compliment almost. You know, it's a slap to the face. It's disrespectful. And it's what they're going to probably do. Um, and he should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Pete Rose, you know, one of my favorite players. I wish I had gotten to see him. I wish I was old enough. But just, just the things that he did for the game of baseball, you don't see that anymore. Mike Trout's the closest thing. Um, and I absolutely love players like that. I know he, I know he bet on the game. I get that. Um, and you don't do that. But. He's the greatest hitter we've ever seen, and and the guy just wants to get in the Hall of Fame. I know he he says he's over it, and whatever happens happens, but they're gonna wait until he dies, and and that's that's sad to me. 
Um, do you guys think that he should be in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at what happened, I, I get it. But all right, let's move on. All right, you know what? It's it's really not that big of a deal. I get it. I get the you know get the arguments for it, but it, it's legal now. I get it. They they want to give him a lifetime ban. You can be. A oh, we just oh. lost Jake. I guess Pete Rose should not go to the Hall of Fame. On that <laughs> one, but, <laughs> what uh, happened to Jake? Oh, man. Rob Manfred just happened? threw him out the door. I guess somebody didn't like my answer. <laughs> look at the look um, on Spencer's face. I, I, if, if, I mean, Pete Rose is still alive, but that was, that was the ghost of Pete Rose. That was wild. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll make it short. Coolest Joe Jackson. I, <laughs> I know we want to talk about Barry Bonds a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, he should be in. It's not a question. I get, I get, he broke rules back then. But you know what? You look at what happened with the Astros this year, and they got a slap on the wrist for what they did. All right, move on. Let's go already. You know what? If someone could do that now, and I know it's not the same, you know, the exact same. Cheating is still cheating. If they got a slap on the wrist for that, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Let's just end this, you know, this stupidity already. It's not the church. Put him in. Him, Barry Bonds, Clemens. Unfortunately, just let's get him in already. These guys are the best. The era, even though I don't like Clemens, he, he's a Hall of Famer. Let's move on. There's no doubt about it. Spencer? You know what? I'm going to go the other way on this one. I can't believe what I'm hearing from you guys. These guys cheated. They destroyed the integrity of the game. They had America going crazy for the home run, and they were hitting it because they were taking performance-enhancing drugs. My Hall of Fame, nobody who's ever taken a single PED is in it. Okay, I'm talking, I'm talking Hank Aaron, I'm talking Willie Mays, I'm talking Ty Cobb, I'm talking guys that didn't need steroids to hit a baseball. I know that Barry Bonds was great before he took steroids with the Pirates. I know he was probably a Hall of Famer before he started taking steroids. But you know what? The second you put that needle into your arm, in my book, you're not a Hall of Famer. You're you're a filthy cheater that needed something to help you succeed. And I, I'm I'm sick of it. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. It makes me so upset that that we want to put these cheaters in the Hall of Pete Fame. Rose, would you put Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame? What do you think about that? Hundred hundred percent. I'm putting okay. Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame. No no doubt sure. about it. I mean, the guy gambled as a coach. Who the who the heck cares about that? Yeah. Wait, let's go back to Barry Bonds. Let's put ourselves in that position. You're the best player mm. in the world. You know that everyone else is using these these performance enhancing drugs so that they can be as good as you. You're not going to do what they're doing so you can make sure you maintain to be the best and make sure you make your money. Listen, I wouldn't do it, but I can't blame him for doing it if he was willing to do it. If he's willing to risk his life for it, it's all about money when it comes down to it. I can't blame him. And you know what? He got a lot out of it. He got a World Series ring out of it. He got he, – he's the lead – you know, the all-time leader in home runs. He's an amazing athlete. He had a great career but I'm not going to give him the Hall of Fame. You mean Hank Aaron is the all-time leader in home runs. Right, exactly. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. John. Thank, thank you yeah. for correcting me. Right. That's but, okay. But no, right. no, that, you know, I, I understand it's why. Atlanta's own. Atlanta's own Hank Atlanta's Aaron. Atlanta's own Hank Aaron. I, I get why Bonds took the PEDs. I, you know, you, you saw what, what it did for his career and, and, and you know, the last, the last 15 years of his career. Um, but, no, I don't want him in my Hall of Fame. My Hall of Fame is pure and PED-free. If you had a child – who would you want them to model their uh, life after? Barry Bonds or Pete Rose? Which player would you want them to model themselves after? I mean, at the, end of, at the end of the day, Pete Rose <laughs> doesn't seem like that bad of a guy. I mean, he he really, I was going to say, Pete Rose really he, didn't do that much wrong. He gambled. He just, okay, big deal. There Ray we Lowe. are. I got one second. Let's go back. <laughs> what year was it? I think 1973, the All-Star game. Ray Fossey. All star catcher who was phenomenal. I wasn't alive back then. Maybe you he destroyed were his career in an all star game running him over. So let's not give Pete Rose this, you know, he's a great guy thing. The guy played hard, which is what I want my players to do. But an all star game, you're not supposed to take another guy out. Well, John gave me a choice between Barry Bonds and Pete Rose. <laughs> not like it was Pete Rose and Mother Teresa. None of the above, okay? <laughs> <sighs> but I will say, you know what? I get the argument for Bonds, but you know what? Are, you, are we going to sit here and really try and say, oh, yeah, all these other guys don't use performance-enhancing drugs? Are we really – We can't say we, that. We, no, we don't know. I know that. We can't – yeah. But, but are we all going to sit here and really disagree that common knowledge says, you know, just relatively fair assumptions are to make 
a, a good majority of players use them in some way or another. Not not necessarily as much as a guy maybe as Bonds did, but just in general have used them. I really highly doubt it that we're going to sit here and say most guys have not because I think we'd be kind of crazy to say that. I'm not saying they use them as much, but I would put some uh, some put some serious money on the fact that a good majority of guys have used it at some point in their career. And if you really want to look at how valuable Bonds was and why he's a Hall of Famer, how many intentional walks did he have? Right. How many times was he walked with the bases loaded? Well, if I the mean, Incredible Hulk, Hulk came up, if the Incredible Hulk came up to the plate, I mean, I wouldn't. The Incredible Hulk would probably strike anyway. out. He would probably <laughs> strike out because he can't. Well, he did baseball. strike out a lot. He did strike out a lot nothing, in his career. You're not wrong the, about that. Nothing compared to today's numbers. If, if fighting if fighting Jeff Kent in the dugout gets you into the Hall of Fame, then Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer. Wow. Oh, and put David Hall Ortiz Hall. put David Ortiz in the Hall of Fame because he broke the Orioles uh phone in the dugout with a bat, went crazy uh years and years ago. That's the one what that thing means. Is this before we, we wrap up on that? <laughs> Barry Bonds did have a lot of walks before ninety nine when just when he's alleged to have used steroids. He still did have Quite a few seasons, over a hundred walks, and I get it. You want to say, "Oh, it's because of the steroids." And you know, he was the as JB called him, uh, you know, at the beginning of our show, uh, you know, months ago now, the incredible Barry Hulk, as uh, as he so eloquently put it. He was before he was that. He was still getting walked plenty. So I will say that right now is, you know, to be fair, he had a plenty of walks before and after the alleged use. Bobby Bonds was better. My final words on the topic. Bolts. Yeah, Bobby Bonds is better, and Daniel Jones is the greatest quarterback of all time. Okay, sure. We'll go with that. <sighs> Archie Manning. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think that's it for us this week because NHL, I got nothing. There's do you love their jerseys? What do you think about their jerseys? Before we go, what about yeah. those retro jerseys? I like them. I saw that, but that was, like, not really important. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's nice jerseys, but. Like I news, love them. news, like big. I, I love news. them. I love them, but it's also I'm like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. And I'm also afraid to say too much because I'm afraid <laughs> the ghost of Pete Rose is going to come attack me again and somehow remove me <laughs> from this call. Don't know what I did to him. That was eerie. That I was rooting for him to be in the Hall of Fame, but something about it, you know, it was Rob Manfred. Was me. It was Manfred. Yeah, it's always his fault. All right. Well, I think that's it for us. Uh, anything else? Am I, am I missing anything? Uh, that's it for Journey with the Jays this week. Make sure you check us out Tuesdays, Facebook Live and YouTube, Thursday, 6 to 7, Real 1100. Check out the Nets podcast. Spencer, what was it again? Fireside Nets. Jake, what about your show? I got uh, on Pigskin Nut. That's the uh, channel we're on. We do Scouting Giants. So if you're a Giants fan, check us out. Um, my inst uh, excuse me, my Twitter is at Jake underscore Malik. Uh, if you want to check me out on Twitter, I post all about my team and all about our show and everything like that. And obviously you can find our Twitter, our show Twitter, which is Journey with the Three. You can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, anywhere uh, you find people on social media. John? Yeah, you can check me out, Blue Hawks 13 on Twitter. Uh, you can check me out, Fantasy and Flavors, Thursday nights from 7 to 8. I represent the Baltimore Ravens professionally. Uh, you can check me out here, obviously, Real 1100 AM. Um, you can check me out, Perched at the Yard on Podbean. Just search Perch Sports or Perched at the Yard. You'll find our podcast on there and my other podcasts that I do. And you can check me out, the program on the Believe Network, and also on the carousel. I got the um, Chargers. Herbert, definitely going to win uh, Rookie of the Year. We heard it here first. All right, guys. Till next week. Be good.